everybody. Good morning, good morning. Uh, hope everyone's enjoying a little bit of breakfast, coffee maybe. I know it's early. Uh, welcome to this edition of the Clean Lakes Alliance, Yohara Lakes 101 Lake Science Cafe. Uh, my name is Sam Brown. I'm with the National Guardian Life Insurance Company. Uh, I'm on the green team there. And along with our presenting sponsors, First Weber Foundation and Johnson Financial Group, hosting sponsor, the Edgewater, the University of Wisconsin, Nelson Institute for Environmental Science, the media partner, the Isthmus, and National Guardian Life Insurance Company is proud to be a supporting sponsor of the Hard Lakes 101 Lake Science Cafe. Um, so, before we get into the meat and potatoes of today's talk, we have a few quick announcements we'd like to get to. First off, we'd like to thank all the businesses and organizations that became Lake Partners uh, this last month of August. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, Lake Partners are those who donate outside of sponsorships and events and tickets. Uh, if you have yet to become a Lake Partner and would like to, please speak with uh, some of our Clean Lakes Alliance employees. They'd love to get you set up on that. Uh, second, Clean Lakes Alliance is taking Yahara Lakes 101 on the road in a couple weeks. Uh, on Thursday, September the 24th, that's September the 24th, okay, you'll get it later. Um, we're going to the Token Creek County Park, the site of Suck the Muck Park 2. Uh, where the county executive is going to get a little uh, overview of what's going on out there and how progress is, along with a quick walking tour, so uh, that's very exciting. Get to see on the ground what the, how the work is going. Uh, to register for this free event, very free, uh, please go to cleanlakesalliance.org. Uh, love to get a head count and everything and see who's going to be there. So, uh, while planning for the future is fantastic, we love to live in the moment. So, today, today's talk is about how climate change affects the lakes. And here to tell us a little bit more about that and to go into uh, introducing this this event speaker is Ms. Stephanie Hayes from TASC. Stephanie? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. That's a pretty good response for a Wednesday. Um, thanks, Sam, for the kind introduction. Um, a lot of times when I say I work at TASC, I usually get two questions. Um, one, do you live, work in that building that looks like a toaster near the airport? And the answer is yes, that's where we are. But a lot of times I get, what does TASC do? So I'm not going to bore you this morning with all kinds of HR acronyms and that sort of thing. What I want to share this morning is that TASC is dedicated to communities where our employees live and work, especially here in Dane County. And we are so proud to partner with organizations like Clean Lake and Lake Lakes Alliance that are doing great work. Um, so I'm not going to go into a ton about what TASC does this morning. I'm going to jump right into why, why everyone's here. So as Sam shared, today's topic is climate change and lake impacts. And presenting on this topic is Dr. Steve Vavras, a senior scientist from the UW-Madison Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies. Steve uses com computer climate models to understand how climate change is changing across the Earth, including Wisconsin and the Great Lakes region. Extreme weather events like last summer's intense rain that led to flooding are an important theme of his research, particularly how they might be affected by climate change. Steve serves as the co-director of the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts and is a member of its climate working group. He has a long-standing interest in lake ice and has modeled how weather and climate variations affect ice cover on our Madison area lakes. In addition to his work at Nelson Institute, like that wasn't enough, Steve, there's, there's more. Steve is also the faculty program coordinator for the Yahara Watershed Academy, which helps educate professional and community members on how to become lake experts at their business or in their community group. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Steve Adams. Well, Steve's getting his microphone set up. He, he decided to remind me to 
Patrice just turned to me just, just a couple seconds ago and says, well, I haven't quite uh, re received my medical degree, so he, he is not an MD. We had a mistake on our, uh, on our slide there, but, but we hope, uh, we did wish you luck in, in reaching that MD well, status. Well, thank you. So if you have a sore hip, don't come see me afterwards. <laughs> So, is the microphone working okay? Can you hear me back there? Great. All right, well, thank you so much for that kind of er, uh, introduction and the invitation to be the initial speaker for the fall uh, series of Yahara Lakes 101. I'm going to be talking about climate change in lakes, which is a, a popular couple of topics right now. And just to get us oriented about why we're here and, and the importance of this, um, why are lakes important? different reasons for different people. Uh, one of them we shouldn't lose sight of is just their sheer beauty. People love to live along lakes and real estate prices reflect that. Recreational purposes, whether you're out boating, fishing, skating, what have you. They serve important ecological function, provide ecosystem services. And then one that I think sometimes gets lost in the shuffle, at least in my opinion, is that they help give us a sense of place particularly in Wisconsin. So we have, what, 15,000 lakes in our state, and uh, the, the annual cycle, the seasonal cycle of ice and uh, fishing and so forth gives us a sense of our identity, I think, in Wisconsin, and, um, and also some of the other upper Midwest states. So I'm gonna start off by talking about where I'm most familiar, and then go into areas where I'm less familiar in the lake impacts, the climate. So starting off here, how has our climate been changing in the past and what's in store for the future as best we can tell? So it should come as no surprise to anybody that the climate has been warming globally. We're setting records or near records almost every year now. Uh, this is a headline from a few years ago from the New York Times 2014, set an all-time heat record that culminated many years of a warming trend starting in the 1880s when uh, full global temperature records began, but then that headline had to be updated the following year, a new temperature record in 2015, and then three years in a row, 2016, three straight years. And you might say, well, maybe things have gotten better since then. Well, not much. Uh, 2017 was the third warmest year on record. Last year was the fourth warmest year on record, and July of this summer was the warmest, warmest month globally on record. And so far for the year through July, we're tied for second place. So almost certainly we're gonna be among the top handful of warmest years yet again. This is the global picture. Now what about lakes? We're here to talk about lakes this morning. And this is a map that's showing temperature trends from a recent paper led by Catherine O'Reilly. A lot of people were involved with this, trying to synthesize temperature records from lakes from all over the world. And the color code here is red indicates a warming trend over roughly the last 25 years, starting in 1985. Blue indicates a cooling trend. And if you just take a big picture look at this, you see that there's a lot more red than blue, right? And some places quite a dark red, uh, including where we are here in the Great Lakes region, also another hot spot here in Northern Europe. So not surprisingly, global temperatures rising, lakes are warming. Um, it is noteworthy, though, that it's not just one part of the world, but really everywhere where we have lake records in just about every continent. So this is a, a widespread warming trend. Closer to home for Madison, I just put this graph together recently showing temperature records from the airport starting in 1940. So with long-term temperature records, it's beneficial if you have the same station, same location, uh, so you're comparing apples to apples. And this Dane County Airport records began right in 1940, so you can produce these averages by decade, and that helps to smooth out some of the year-to-year -year variability. And what you see, first of all, is that the 2010s, right, our decade, or current decade, is the warmest on record by a fair amount. And you see that there's been a pretty steady warming trend since the 1960s, although interestingly, the 1940s and 1950s were a bit warmer than the 60s, 70s, or 80s. So there is some variation by decade, but certainly in the last 50 years, we see this distinct warming trend. And um, we're just about done with the 20 teens, so this bar isn't gonna change much before December. So this is the annual trend. This is the sort of the average. But what about 
changes in extremes. Those might be more important uh, for, uh, for society and for lakes specifically. So what we can do is look at uh, trends also in extreme weather. So this is uh, an index, the Climate Extreme <coughs> Index, which is put together by NOAA, which has been in the news a lot the last few days, if you've been keeping up with the news. Uh, I promise you I did not take a Sharpie to enter these images. So you can take these to the bank. Uh, this is one that I, I really like. Um, the records go back to 1910. And the Climate Extremes Index is uh, an integration of the amount or extent of extreme weather around the country in terms of extreme heat, extreme cold, extreme wet, extreme dry, and uh, summed up in one year, given year, of how much of the country experienced those sorts of extremes. And so the red bars indicate year-to-year -year variations, and there's a lot. Uh, the green is a running average over a decade, and that helps to smooth out some of these short-term fluctuations. And I think it's pretty clear, you can see that the last part of the record, say the last 25 years, has seen a really high amount of extreme weather. You pick out 2012 was the all-time record high, 2016 second place, then 2015, and even last year we made it into the top 10. So, you know, anecdotally, I bet most of us would say it seems like we're getting more extreme weather, whether it's hurricanes or uh, floods or what have you. And the records really bear that out. It's not just our imagination. And one of the, the components of this extreme uh, climate extremes index is heavy precipitation. And that's what I'm going to show next. So this is essentially the same index, but now just the part of it that is from heavy daily rainfalls. And here, I think it's even clearer to see in the last 25 years, starting in the mid-1990s, there was almost this uh, step jump toward this tendency to have many years with heavy extreme rainfall, not just here, but around the country. In fact, almost all the years that are high have occurred since the mid-1990s. And that's noteworthy, as we'll get into here in terms of lake impacts. So that was the national average. If we break it down by region, we see this um, trend going back from 1958 to, to 2016, and put together by Climate Central. And the first takeaway is that every part of the continental U.S. has seen an increase in these heavy downpours. This is the, the daily, uh, about 1% of daily rainfall amounts. But regionally, here we are in the upper Midwest, and we're almost as high as anywhere. Just the Northeast has had a bit higher trend. Uh, but we have certainly seen our share of um, heavy rainfalls in the last few decades, consistent with um, a lot of the other trends nationally. And again, boiling this down at the big picture scale down to the local scale, this is another graph that I just put together, which I find really interesting. And I, I, I'm not sure completely what to make of it. So this is just the same type of figure that I showed earlier for temperature from the Madison Airport. But now these are decadal averages for precipitation, the annual precipitation amount. And uh, what you see again is that we're extreme, we've hit an extreme record this decade, the 20 teens uh, are the wettest on record, and it's been almost a continuous increase over time since the 1940s. So it's really striking. We're now wetter this decade, more than a third wetter than the 1940s, when the average was 28 inches, and now we're getting close to 40 inches. 2019 was another wet year, uh, so this, again, this bar is not going to change much. <coughs> And what I'm finding, I haven't finished this analysis, but what's interesting is that the, this increase in the, the total is not driven primarily by the really, really extreme rainfalls like we had last August, but actually by the, what you might call moderate extremes, daily rainfalls between one, inches, one inch and three inches. And um, so I think that's interesting too. The, the heavier ones just don't happen as often to contribute to the total as much. But when they do happen, they make big news and they have enormous disproportionate impacts, as we saw last, almost exactly a year ago right now, last August 20th. And um, how many of you were around here in the area? So yeah, it's, you haven't forgotten, none of us have, particularly if you live somewhat west of Madison. So this is a figure that um, my colleague Dan Wright at Engineering Department at UW put together, uh, showing rain gauge data. Um, these rainfall totals, the dark blue indicates a foot 
So to me, this always looks like snowstorm map, you know, like this is what we would expect maybe for a heavy snowstorm here. But again, these are liquid. This is inches of rain and not snow. So you can see that actually in terms of the isthmus here, we lucked out in spite of how much rain fell. If this had just moved about 10 miles to the east, we would have been in much bigger trouble. As it was, of course, there was enormous amounts of damage around the county and the city, uh, something like $150 million damage in Dane County alone. Uh, lots of flooded streets, of course, unfortunately one fatality. And uh, unofficially, this set a record for the heaviest 24-hour rainfall in these areas to the southwest around Cross Plains. Now, fortunately, a lot of this was surface flooding. And so, you know, if you had to drive through the streets, you remember scenes like this, but really those, those recede within a few hours. The problem is if you're uh, a lake that is groundwater fed, like one that's very close to where I live in Beloit, you have bigger problems because groundwater takes much, much longer to recede after heavy rains or after a long-term uh, trend toward wetter conditions. And this, um, this is the South Beloit Community Park located just over the state line. It's been closed ever since last fall. And just to give you a sense, this is this light pole here. That's normally the edge of the lake, Victoria Lake, and it's spilled over. And this, it's so bad, it's gonna take so long that there's talk about closing the park for good because it's just become such a problem with these heavy rains and the, the trend toward wetter weather, cost of repairs and so on. So this is probably a casualty of climate change right in the community, it's the only part working there. So that's the trend that we've seen so far. Now what about the future? Well, we think there's probably gonna be more of the same. Warmer and wetter is what we're looking at. And the reason we think that is based largely on climate models, global climate models that have been downscaled to uh, the scale of Wisconsin or the eastern United States to take into account things like proximity to lakes or elevation, and river valleys, and so on. So this data set was put together by my colleague in the Center for Climatic Research, Dave Lorenz, and it's showing the projected changes in annual precipitation in percent for late century, late this century compared to late 20th century for the high end, sort of the, the pessimistic greenhouse gas emission scenario, assuming we burn a lot of the fossil fuels that we have remaining. And what, what I want you to notice here is this color is sort of light green and that indicates a wetter climate in the future. The second thing to take away though is the magnitude of the change. The climate models are actually projecting fairly modest annual changes. This is a 5% increase, 10% increase, 15% increase, which is actually smaller than the trend we've already seen in Madison. So it's not clear how to interpret that. It's possible that the climate models are not sensitive enough to greenhouse warming, and maybe this is an underestimate, or it could be that the recent trend we've seen in Madison, that dramatic increase over since the 1940s, has been due in large part to just natural variability. And maybe we won't see such heavy rainfall amounts in the precipitation amounts in future decades. So the jury's still out on that. But probably more important than the annual total is to break it down by season. And here we have winter, uh, spring, summer, and autumn. The biggest percentage increases are expected during winter. Everywhere in the state is expected to become wetter later this, uh, this century to the tune of about 20%. Similar uniform, near uniform increases, 15, 20% in spring. Everywhere is supposed to get wetter, but not by as much in autumn. But the season to really take note of is summer. And this washed out pattern is indicating not so much that the models think that we won't see a change in the total rainfall during summer, but really a disagreement among different models. So this is the average of say two dozen different climate models, and some of them predict that we'll see a wetter summer climate, substantially wetter, maybe 25%, and others say that we're, no, we're gonna get more drought conditions, maybe 20, 25% drier. So when you take the average, you get this very faded pattern that looks like no change, but I would caution that what it really means is that people like me need to figure out which of those models to believe which ones to discount. So that one is, is troublesome because that's when we get, that's the season when we get most of our precipitation in Wisconsin and including the heavy rainfall amounts. 
When we look at the same kind of maps for projected changes in temperature by season, it's a little simpler story. We see similar warming in all seasons. So these color scales are somewhere around 9, 10, 11, 12 degrees warming, which is huge. Degrees Fahrenheit, not Celsius, fortunately. Um, but again, this is the high-end uh, greenhouse gas emission scenario. Hopefully it's the worst case. But the, the main takeaway here is that there's similar warming trends in every season, although winter is the one where the models say that we'll probably warm the most, in large part because of the reduction in snow cover, which helps to chill the climate at present. And in a warmer climate, less snow cover, less of a chilling effect. And we care about extremes so much. This is looking at heavy rainfalls projected in the future. This is the number of days per decade with heavy rainfall of at least two inches everywhere in the state. This is the recent past, the late 21st or late 20th century. And you see these darker colors are the most, and that's in the south and the west. So for instance, here in Madison, uh, this color means that about 12 days per decade, or typically about one per year. And in the future, that pattern continues by late 21st century, but the models are saying just amplified everywhere that gets more today. We get even more in the future, but the Northeast probably won't see as many as the Southwest. And Madison here is 18, so 15, roughly a 50% increase in the frequency of these really heavy rainfalls in the future. That's what we're looking at. So that's, in a nutshell, the climate story. And now I'm going to shift gears and talk about what the impact uh, is of these weather and climate uh, changes or weather variations. And I'm going to focus on five themes, because I can't cover everything in 40 minutes. So lake ice being the first, and water quality, the lake levels, fish species, and invasives. I'm going to start off with lake ice, because it's probably the simplest, um, has the simplest connection with climate and weather. One of the dramatic examples of the impact of lake ice on lake ecology is that sometimes you get big fish kills if you have a year with a lot of lake ice. This is a, an example here from about 10 years ago from a harsh winter in Minnesota, and all of these are dead fish in the early spring that this guy is raking up. And the reason this happens is that you get this barrier when the ice forms over the lake uh, which helps to prevent the circulation of oxygen from the atmosphere from getting into the lake. And if you get heavy snowfall, as occurred that year, on top of the ice, it blocks the sunlight really effectively. Uh, that helps to uh, reduce uh, photosynthesis in the lake. Uh, the vegetation begins to die, uses up the oxygen, and you get these fish kills. So probably one benefit in terms of a warming climate with less lake ice is probably fewer fish kills during the winter. But as we'll see, there are a lot of other negatives to that change. So I'm going to uh, describe this connection here between temperature and lake ice. And uh, I want to use this, borrow this term climatometer uh, that Dick Lathrop and John Magnuson coined a few years ago. And it's a, a really apt term because it turns out that the presence or absence of lake ice and the thickness of ice is dictated very strongly by temperature, as you might imagine. But it's surprising to me how strong it is. So there, you know, it depends somewhat on snowfall and, and humidity and wind and, and so on. But the first order, if you know the temperature uh, in the past or in the future, day to day, you can do a great job of estimating the amount of duration and thickness of lake ice. So it's a really useful uh, relationship. And John Magnuson led a study about 20 years ago now, quite well known, where he looked at temperature records from around the northern hemisphere. And some of these go way back, 150 years or more. And if you're a, a Yahar Lakes 101 groupie, you've probably seen this before. I know John has talked in, in this uh, session before. And these freeze dates and, and breakup dates recorded over time show a distinct trend toward um, later changes in breakup days changing by about a week uh, earlier and um, freeze dates occurring about almost a week later. And knowing the relationship between ice cover and temperature, you can then tease out the warming trend as an independent measure of how much warming we've had. And from that study, they estimated about an 
degrees Celsius per century, although that was 20 years ago, so surely now it would be even more. One of the lakes that went into that record was right here, Lake Mendota, a few feet from where we're standing. And we have this gold line of the temperature record for Lake Mendota, year by year uh, duration of ice here, going back to the 1850s. And no years are missing, which is amazing for a climate record. And you can see that despite some, a lot of year-to-year -year variability, there's been this distinct downward trend indicating a warming winter, late fall, early spring climate around here. And one way to think of this is to pick out the top five longest winters of ice cover in blue. And those all occurred from the 1880s or earlier during the colder climate of the 19th century. And the five winters with the least amount of ice cover have all occurred since the 1980s. So a very distinct climate change right here in Madison reflected by our lakes. And so this may make us wonder, are we looking at, you know, assuming this trend continues in the warming climate, are we going to look back at the good old days of, of ice cover with uh, fat tire bike riding and skating and sailing and broom ball and the like? And the answer is probably. So one of the things one can do, knowing this relationship between air temperature and ice cover, is to not only sort of reconstruct what the air temperature changes have been in the past, but also make estimates and predictions for how the lake ice will change in the future, as long as one knows the air, daily air temperature. And so I did this a few years ago, looking at a set of different global climate models downscale to Madison. And I looked at their projections, first for the past and then for the future, um, and, and used those relationships to estimate and calibrate the model uh, as a probability here of how often or how likely Lake Mendota was to freeze in a given winter. So for the late 20th century, all of them show 100%, which is good because 100% of the time the lakes did freeze during that period and they simulated a duration of ice of three months, which is very accurate. Now, when we go ahead to the future, a few decades from now, mid 20th, 21st century, we see things start to change. Some of the models say that we'll continue to have perennial ice cover that far into the future. One of them says almost every winter, and one of them only says about half the time will that occur. And on average, they're saying that the amount or duration of ice cover will shrink by about half. You can kind of see where I'm going with this. By late century now, a fundamental change, all of the models say that we'll no longer have perennial ice cover on Lake Mendota, and when it occurs, it'll only last about a third as much. And so the takeaway here is that about a third of the winters in the late part of this century are projected to be ice-free. So that is a huge change. Certainly, if you live in Madison, you couldn't help but notice that if you're still around then. And so, <laughs> I won't be, but a lot of people will be. And so what we're looking at is more situations like this, where we're, we may be right on the edge of uh, ice cover, or not ice cover, just depending on the whims of the weather in a particular winter. So that's lake ice. Now another lake impact from climate change is water quality. Um, now I'm starting to get into areas where I'm less familiar. I'm not a limnologist, but I'm relying on others who are. Uh, one of these uh, paintings is Madeline McGee, who works in the DNR and is a, a lake expert. And one of the, this is a slide I borrowed from her. Uh, one of the concerns about water quality is that as temperatures rise, we tend to get less oxygen into the bottom of a lake, and that has impacts on fish. So this is a, a figure from January to December showing the annual cycle of temperature. This is the surface of a lake, and here's the bottom. Red colors indicating warm, so these are the summer months. And then the oxygen levels, dissolved oxygen here, red means low. And so you see this high correspondence, and that's because warmer lake waters are lighter, they're less dense, they don't mix as readily, and so the oxygen from the atmosphere doesn't get to the bottom of the lakes as easily. And the reason that matters is that for certain fish, like Cisco, uh, they are highly dependent on um, cold water with oxygen. And uh, John Lyons, who's formerly at the DNR, put together this slide as showing that Cisco is threatened by increased warming trends, and uh, anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of the lakes in Wisconsin are at risk. Another way that water quality is affected is through changes in precipitation. As I showed, the climate's becoming wetter, and it's expected to get even wetter 
And typically, as a rule of thumb, water clarity goes down with precipitation, particularly in these heavy rainfalls. And we've seen lots of examples of these carpets of green on our lakes, unfortunately, in recent years. And uh, it's uh, largely a result of phosphorus getting into the lakes, also E. coli bacteria, and a, a very distinct consequence of this would be beach closings. And even if you put in these exposures to try to keep out the algae, uh, you're fighting a, a battle, an uphill battle. And um, so we've all seen examples of that probably where uh, ourselves or our kids have been unable to swim at a beach because of these algae uh, blooms. And one of the, this has been a highly studied topic as you can imagine, uh, one of the most important studies that came out recently was led by Steve Carpenter, a former professor here in the Center for Limnology, looking at the impact of phosphorus runoff into the lakes. And a lot of it comes from manure in rural areas and also leaves and uh, fertilizer in urban areas. And what they found in this study is that the precipitation and phosphorus input to Lake Mendota is highly correlated and that the highest inputs occur during late winter and spring. This is a time when there has been a lot of manure spreading in the past. And what's really key is that only about one month's worth of days account for three-fourths of the annual phosphorus load into Mendota, helping to create these algal blooms. To me, that's good news, because that means we can really target this one month. We can kind of exclude the other 12 or other 11 months and really focus on this late winter and spring period as a way of trying to reduce the total phosphorus runoff into the lakes and improve water quality. So why is winter and spring so important? Those happen to be the months when we're uh, expecting the biggest increases in precipitation in the future. And they're also a complication in terms of runoff. They, they create more problems of this pollutant runoff, partly because even though we don't get as much precipitation in winter, that's the season when we get a lot of snow melt. And so we, if we warm up, even without rain or snow, we get runoff into the lakes. The ground is frozen in winter, so it doesn't infiltrate. The water runs off instead. A lot of times you'll find manure on fields that time of year. And in the spring, especially, the soils are wet, waterlogged. They don't take up the runoff, and so it goes right into the lakes. So this is kind of a double whammy. Winter and spring uh, are favorable for more runoff into the lakes, and we're expecting more precipitation in the future during winter spring. Another lake impact or climate impact for our lakes is lake levels and we certainly don't need much of a reminder of that compared, uh, after last summer and fall. Uh, this is a figure showing uh, impacts from the, it was from the state journal here, uh, the isthmus being highly vulnerable, parts of it along the Ahara River, all along the, the area lakes, lots of sandbags and um, you know, real trouble, right? for our, our lake levels. And for a small lake, like, like all of the Yahara lakes, it's a fairly easy relationship. You know, if the water table is high because we've had a lot of precipitation in recent years and we got a big dump of rain like we had last August, the lake levels are gonna rise. For other lakes, though, like the Great Lakes, the picture is a lot more complicated. There's more factors, it's a bigger watershed, um, ice cover, snow melt and so on have big impacts, temperature. Uh, and so this figure from the Army Corps of Engineers goes back a century, showing that all the different lake levels on the various Great Lakes. And you see a lot of interesting things here. You certainly see a seasonal cycle, for instance, in Lake Superior very clearly. You also see a lot of these ups and downs that maybe have no obvious explanation. But one of the things to take away here is that right now the Great Lakes are at or near record highs. If you've been over that way, you'll see what I mean. And uh, Lake Superior, for example, the highest since the 1980s right now. Lake Michigan, Huron, similar. Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, the, the highest in the entire century record. They're really impressive right now. And yet, just to show how variable this is, for Lake Superior and Lake Michigan, we see that just about six years ago, they were at or near record lows. So these things change quickly, and it's not just simply a matter of warming climate means higher lake levels. So in terms of lake impacts on the Great Lakes, I think the picture is very complicated, and we don't have a good handle on how that'll change in the future because of all the other 
factors besides just local rainfall that really matter. Another impact uh, certainly is on fishes and fisheries. Uh, this is a headline that just came out this spring, brook trout to walleyes, warming waters to play havoc with fisheries. And the reason is that a lot of fish are very sensitive to temperature. Uh, it's not just Cisco in terms of dissolved oxygen. This is a figure that Gretchen Hansen uh, put together. She's at the University of Minnesota, a limnologist, uh, showing that the way climate change warms the temperatures and how different fish species have different temperature tolerances. So for instance, some of these cold water fish like lake trout like it real cold, and they probably won't do well in a warming climate, but relatively speaking, a, a largemouth bass can do a much better job. And so she led a study a few years ago looking at how water temperature across Wisconsin affects different species. So looking at a whole series of lakes, uh, comparing based on observations, the probability of walleye existing as a function of, of air temperature compared to largemouth bass. And the temperature measurement here is degree days, which is an integrated measure of temperature over the course of a season or a year. To the left is cooler, to the right is warmer. And so consistent with that last graph, walleye don't do as well when it warms up. That's the blue line. So they're less likely to occur in a warm lake or a warm climate. And largemouth bass do relatively better. And um, they can change and increase their abundance as the temperatures are, and the lakes are higher today and presumably as the climate warms. What I think is interesting about this figure, though, even more, is how suddenly these things can change. So for whatever reason, right here, there's a big jump the largemouth bass population going from unlikely below this to likely uh, presence at temperatures warmer than that. And similar walleye, very stable for a while, and then kind of a collapse, and then another stable condition. So a lot of factors involved in this, but um, certainly we'll, we'll likely see changes in fish populations. And if you are an angler, this has big importance for you. Another uh, factor of how climate affects lakes is in terms of invasive aquatic species. This is an area that I'm definitely not an expert in, but Jay van der Zanden here, and, and the professor in limnology is, and he's done quite a bit of work on this, including many years ago leading the study from ecological applications, looking at how climate change um, and human activities combine to affect invasive species in complicated ways. So climate change can alter the physical and chemical conditions and also alter the species composition and interactions between them. And so they go through this three-step process of how invasive species can take over a lake or not. Uh, the first, colonization. So the question is, can the invaders reach the new ecosystem? Maybe they can, maybe they can't. Uh, if they can, that doesn't mean that they'll become a problem. First, they have to establish. And so there's questions about whether they'll be able to establish, whether the lake conditions are hospitable or not. And even if they can establish, do they have an impact? Do they have an adverse impact on the native biota? And so if the invasives meet all three of those criteria, then yes, they become a big problem. And we've seen two very dramatic examples locally here in Lake Mendota, the spiny water flea and zebra mussels. The spiny water flea um, shown here, not life-size, by the way, uh, fortunately. <laughs> But uh, the problem with spiny water flea is that they like to eat daphnia. And daphnia are critters that like to eat algae. And so if you eat the species that like to eat algae, now you have more algae. And so one of the problems with this uh, abundance of spiny water flea in Lake Mendota is that it's favored more algal blooms recently. And then zebra mussels actually help to clear the water, but they cause other problems. And just over the last five years, they have really taken over from being under the radar to having you know, examples of this. This is a, a piece of wood that came out of Lake Mendota, just covered with zebra mussels. And um, in the Yahara Watershed Academy, we've been out on Lake Mendota for a class trip and seen even more dramatic examples like this. You just can't even believe there must be millions of mussels in our lake right now. And so those two have definitely met the three criteria for becoming a problem. So these are some of the problems, talk some about the climate changes, but what are the best ways to help the lakes adapt to a changing climate? We want to have an optimistic message here, feel like we're doing something. One thing we can do is to help address the runoff problem itself. 
So we know a lot about stormwater runoff remediation. We have a, a world expert here, Ken Potter, uh, an emeritus professor in, in engineering, who's done a lot of work along with others on this topic. Uh, things like green roofs that help to, to trap the rainwater and keep it from running off the roofs. Rain barrels, rain gardens, um, cisterns and the like. Bioretention in parking lots, so we actually store the stormwater instead of it just running off the pavement. And where you do have pavement, having pervious instead of impervious pavement is a way to increase uh, recharge into the groundwater and keep those um, flashy uh, inputs of stormwater from being as big of a problem, uh, bringing with them pollutants into the lakes. Other action being done at the county level, you know, the next Yohar Lakes 101 is featuring Joe Parisi. He introduced an initiative to help small farms in the area build manure storage facilities. And going back to that um, winter spring issue, this can help reduce manure application so that there's something to do with all that manure in the, those seasons instead of applying it to the fields. And uh, the goal is that you would decrease the phosphorus runoff during those seasons. And as many of you know, that gives you a lot of bang for your buck because a pound of phosphorus can translate to 500 pounds of algae. So this is something that just got off the ground in the last year or two. Hopefully it'll bring some noticeable results soon. Another uh, adaptation work that's being done is something that I'm something near and dear to me, the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts. Uh, I'm now the co-director of that, along with Van Feinmont. And the purpose of Wiki is to find ways to help the state adapt to a changing climate in all sorts of ways. We have stakeholders in various areas represented largely by these working groups within Wiki. Uh, climate is the one I'm most involved in, but you see there's all sorts of different topics. This is not an inclusive list of themes affected by climate, but it's where we have the, the people to do it and the interest to do it. Uh, I highlight here for this talk the areas that are most relevant to today, water resources, for example, and then some of these other working groups. And I should note that there's a developing working group, the Great Lakes, that's coming online soon, and it'll be addressing the impacts of water levels and other factors for the Great Lakes. The Water Resources Working Group got together about a year and a half ago and organized a workshop on specifically dealing with lake impacts from climate change, and I've been borrowing heavily from that. So Madeline McGee was the lead author of that, and it just came out this summer, if you want to get a copy. And not coincidentally, they focused from this workshop on the four themes of lake levels, water quality, invasive species, and fisheries. So sound familiar? And so rather than inventing, reinventing the wheel, I largely borrowed this, um, my talk, using these four themes that they came up with. And the message they are conveying here for adaptation strategies boiled down to the three R's, which is not reading, writing, and arithmetic, but instead, in this case, resistance, resilience, and response. So resistance is defending high value lakes against changes caused by climate. So this would be things like green infrastructure, limiting pollutant input, pollution inputs, um, common sense sorts of things. Resilience is improving the capacity of the lake to return to prior conditions when it was healthier and climate change was less, less of an issue. So an example of that would be restoring wetlands. We've had a lot of wetland loss in Dane County and elsewhere, of course. Wetlands are really good at filtering rainwater and also acting like sponges to help slow the flow and the intensity of stormwater runoff, and so that has benefits as well. And then response is almost along the lines, not quite along the geoengineering lines, the things that you do um, to intentionally accommodate change to try to minimize undesired outcomes. So things like beach exposure systems, like I showed in the earlier figure, would be one example. Um, but to me, that's sort of a last response. I mean, that's, you don't want to have to do that. You'd rather go with the resistance and the resilience. And if you want more information on this, we have some handouts. I think quite a few handouts, as I, as I understand it. Is that in the back by the tables? OK. So they boiled down that paper into a very usable form. Uh, Climate Wisconsin 2050. This is a part of a series that Wiki has produced. And this is directly from that workshop in the, the journal article. And it's really great, because they've got all sorts of uh, summaries of things like how to improve water quality, summarizing the climate impacts, 
and a list of adaptation strategies, much more depth than I can get into. It's very readable, it's about seven, eight pages. You don't have to be an expert, and it's a really good reference. So I commend that group for doing this work. It's really important. So I'm gonna wrap up now and leave enough time for questions and discussion. Won't be a surprise if you've been paying attention today that warmer and wetter is kind of the theme when it comes to climate change, both in the recent past, locally and nationally, as well as where we're expected to go in the future. We're expecting large temperature increases in all seasons and more precipitation, at least in the winter, spring, and autumn. Summer, as I said, is a wild card. And what isn't a wild card is that extreme rainfalls are likely going to become more common and heavier as the warming climate puts more moisture in the atmosphere, so there's more moisture to wring out when we get the right conditions. In terms of impacts, an obvious one, almost a certain one, is less lake ice cover if it warms up. Uh, probably higher lake levels overall for inland lakes if Wisconsin's <coughs> climate projections for a wetter climate which are come to pass. Most likely additional nutrient and bacteria runoff into lakes, partly because of the, the heavier rainfalls in the future. More thermally stratified lakes, especially in the, the summer and the uh, shoulder seasons, which can lead to oxygen depletion and, and affect certain fish. And the lakes should become more favorable for some fish relative to others. So relatively speaking, species like largemouth bass may benefit at the expense of others such as walleye and cisco. There's lots of uncertainties to keep people like me busy and employed. And some of them I list here, uh, for instance, the summer rainfall changes. That is a big question mark and a really critical one in terms of lake impacts. How will invasive species respond? That's not my cup of tea, but it's, uh, as I showed before, it's complicated and folks like Jake Van Der Zanden and Jake Walsh are leading the charge on that. How sensitive are fish species to known temperature tolerances? A study by Gretchen Hansen was indicating, you know, in the present day what the ranges are in favorable uh, temperature thresholds, but we really don't know for sure how adaptive and how resilient some of these fish species are. Maybe they're, uh, they can tolerate a greater temperature range, maybe not, it remains to be seen. And then finally, for adaptation strategies, uh, resist, respond, and resil. Uh, resilience, as you can read about in the uh, 2050 flyer, if you're interested, uh, reducing the speed of stormwater by whatever means, increasing infiltration for green infrastructure uh, and the like is important. And then finally, just to leave with, with the message that both urban and rural uh, uh, factors are important for phosphorus runoff and having partnerships between the two groups is important, the Clean Lakes Alliance is fostering uh, if we're really going to tackle this problem of phosphorus runoff into the lakes uh, in the present climate and the future, we need to deal with that collectively. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Can we hear me? There we go. I'm going to have Steve uh, stay up on the stage, and as we've done in the past, if you could raise your hand, I'm going to walk the microphone to, to the, the people that I see that raise their hands, and then just grab my attention, uh, and then we'll continue that process until we run out of time, but we have a good uh, 10, 12 minutes to be able to go through some questions. Did I see your hand? I see. How are you doing? Thanks for the figure. <laughs> Yeah, uh, fishing with your bicycle, uh, ice fishing with your bicycle. Uh, I'm wondering how actively you're consulting with local governments and emergency planners and state government about the uh, changes that they'll have to, you know, implement in their operations. More snow power, dealing with flooding. Um, are local governments uh, reaching out for that kind of information? Yes, they are. So that's one of the. Wiki is a statewide effort, and we're certainly happy and, and try to reach out to different groups, including emergency management planners. I was just at a, a workshop a couple weeks ago in Baraboo about flooding and, and problems. And there were people from you know, emergency managers, floodplain managers, all sorts of different groups, including uh, uh, some municipal leaders who were there. Uh, recently, the city of Madison has reached out to us and is very interested in trying to incorporate climate change into their operations. I know the county is as well. Um, I think there's signs at the statewide level that perhaps something is 
uh, in the works there to try to you know deal with climate change on a, a more coordinated basis among agencies. So we're very hopeful for that, and, and Wiki is is eager to establish those kinds of partnerships because ultimately that's where the, the uh, application comes in. You know, we have the, the theory of climate measurements, but then you know actually what's going to happen in terms of policy. So we are working on that, and we're eager to establish more of those partnerships as they. Uh, Thanks. Is just curious. Has anybody studied what the impact of an open water lake is compared to an ice covered lake for local weather conditions? Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, if it's a big lake, you would expect that um, a more open lake in the winter means more evaporation, and a big lake like Lake Michigan or certainly Lake Superior that can lead to more lake effect snow. And we see lots of examples of that. The lake effect snow machine really is strong in the, the autumn or early winter when we have a colder outbreak, but later in the winter when the lake becomes ice covered, it largely shuts down because the ice acts as a barrier for that evaporation and moisture. For a small lake like Mendota, it has minimal impacts. Um, you can sometimes, if you're living around Madison and observant, you can sort of pick up, you know, steam fog uh, on a cold winter morning when the lake is ice free, um, sometimes even some downstream clouds a little bit. But our lakes are small enough that they don't really have a strong weather impact. If you're right along the lake shore in December um, uh, on a cold morning, you could probably feel a little bit warmer. But uh, our lakes are small enough here in Madison, the inland lakes, that it doesn't have a big impact. But yeah, Lake Superior and how lake ice will change in the future is a very uncertain one. You could argue it either way that it could become greater um, or it could become less. Good question. I'm curious about um, how the Wiki group is um, including young people, high school students, in their advocacy efforts. Well, Wiki is very much a bottom-up organization, and whoever's interested, we're certainly happy to have them under the Wiki umbrella. We haven't had a specific education component as of yet, as of the current date, but we're certainly open to uh, opportunities, whether it's from teachers or students. Because ultimately, there's a lot of, uh, I would say, a lot more interest and concern among younger people regarding climate change than people myself and older. So that would be, we'd certainly welcome that opportunity. I've seen a couple hands here that are lined up, so but I want to make sure I also get people on the other side of the room. So make sure you catch my attention if you have a question. What is the effect of rain on the ice in the winter on the lake? On and the lake? The, lake yes. Ice? Yeah, so for the spring yeah, and, well, and the bacteria, cyanobacteria. Oh, the, the yeah. biological impact. Yeah. That I'm not certain about. I mean, certainly we get puddling and uh, it, it can actually darken the lake and, and help to melt it further. In terms of the effects on cyanobacteria, I'm not sure. Uh, you mean actually the, the rain falling right on the lake rain itself? And getting rid of the snow cover and more <coughs> light going through the ice. I mean, how does this? Yeah, so the, the snow, well, the, the ice helps to block sunlight to a degree, but snow on top of ice does it a lot better, and you don't need a whole lot of snow. And so if you get heavy, you know, a decent amount of snowpack, you basically shut off a, almost all sunlight coming into the lake, so that can certainly have a big impact on the, the uh, oxygen concentration. Hi, you had a nice piece in the paper a few weeks ago about how Humidity levels have gotten higher and how it's affecting nighttime temperatures um, and that, all the issues related to human health, related to heat and things. I wonder from a lake perspective, there's some evidence back in the 30s and 40s that earlier in the summer, the lake temperatures were as warm as they are today, but by late summer, say around the 1st of September, uh, things were cooling off. I'm wondering if the humidity levels do we have data to go way back on how humidity has changed back from the early part of the say, 1900s and how that's going to affect uh, the thermal regime and the evaporation and the cooling off of temperatures, say, later in the summer, carrying in the fall? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't know if we have direct, we probably do, I, I, humidity measurements, if you go back to the, some of the log books. You could infer the humidity to a degree because of the, um, the, the nighttime lows back in, in those days. Um, there was a study done a few years ago looking at trends in humidity in terms of the dew point. 
around the country, all these weather stations around the country from about mid sort of 1930s or so to the present. And they show that around here and for the country as a whole, the humidity has been going up. And so, um, you know, to the extent that it would keep the lakes warmer, higher humidities today would keep the lakes warmer, you trap the heat uh, going into the fall, it should have an effect. But probably for the lakes, specifically to your question, it would probably depend on the humidity levels in like September, October, probably. Uh, we'd need to pinpoint it. Uh, although, as I recall from that study, every season showed an increase in humidity around here. So probably it does, it would help that keep the lakes a little warmer in the fall. While we're waiting to see if there's any more questions, I, I, I don't know if this was mentioned at the beginning, but Steve is our lead coordinator for the Yahara Watershed Academy. And that's our, uh, we, we do this program every other year. It's a, a five day program, five full days, one day a month over the course of five, five months. Um, it's really designed for, for neophytes, people who are interested in, in learning more about the lakes, but aren't necessarily, don't, you don't need to be a professional water quality manager or scientist to, to take this course. Uh, both uh, classroom and outdoor field activities occur during, during the course. We just graduated 23 watershed captains, we call them, those who graduate from the program back in June and will be doing uh, another round of recruitment uh, next uh, fall, winter time period for the, the 2021 class. So I wanted to mention that. I see there's another question over here. Thank you. The uh, prediction for more snowfall and, uh, or non more precipitation in the winter, will that translate into um, greater uh, snow depths or will the warming temperatures mean less snow depths? That's a great question. Um, it's not obvious, right? It, more precipitation in the winter could well mean more snowfall. Um, it could also, it almost certainly means more, a higher proportion of precipitation will be rain. Um, but, you know, if you have more moisture in the air and you happen to get a, a cold front through, uh, suddenly you can get a foot of snow, right? Even in a warming climate. So. I would say that in the near term, over the next decade or two, it could well be that we'll see more snowfall for, for the reasons that you said, that you have more moisture in the air, more precipitation, temperatures still not warming too differently than what we see in the past. Eventually, though, the amount of warming will probably win out and we'll see more rain rather than uh, snow. A concern, very practical concern, is that uh, in places to our south have more ice, uh, freezing rain events than we do. Uh, in the past, we've typically been snow, sometimes rain in the winter, um, but places like central Illinois, or where I grew up in central Indiana, lots of freezing rain and ice, and well, we saw examples of that this winter right here in Madison and southern Wisconsin. So that's a big concern too, if you go from typically snow toward typically freezing rain uh, toward eventually more winter rain, that transition may be painful. I think we have time for just maybe one or two more questions. Sort of great presentation. Um, on the slide that you have up now, on your conclusions, the adaptation strategy is the one that I think is something of a bugaboo is resilience. And that's because all the data that you presented, and rightly so, show a continuous warming trend, it shows a continuous increasing precipitation trend. From a resilience perspective, you really can't return to what was a stable norm for a lake, for example, because that stable norm becomes a dynamic. So we have to sort of take the data that we're looking at and the analysis work and sort of try and create what that stable norm will be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, because that's really where we're going to be. We're not going to be at a stable norm 20 years ago. Right. Yep, I agree. It's always a moving target. And I think you know, a lot of the resilience strategies are, are well, I have to read the paper to look at all of them, but things like wetland restoration, you know, that the attempt is to, to go back in some sense to where, how things used to be, but knowing that you can't really uh, go back uh, completely either. The strategies are, are right. At least the goal. Is stability 
production within them. That's the yep, I agree. Good point. Let's give us uh, Steve a round of applause again.